the show not All right, so welcome everyone to the latest SFOX interview uh, with Tim Enneking. Tim is the Managing Director of Digital Capital Management and also the Managing Director of Mana Companies Asset Management. And he has the distinction of having run the first crypto fund uh, and he's a client at SFOX to boot. Uh, so Tim, thank you so much for joining us today. We're so excited to have you here and pick your brain about all things crypto and asset management. Sure, thanks very much for the invitation. I figured uh, as we dive into this, you know, some of SFOX's clientele is in the um, crypto fund space, but I'd say there's a lot of people who aren't really familiar with what it's like to create or run a fund, two things with which you have a lot of experience. So I was hoping you could dive into just a little bit about what it was like uh, to create a fund and then also what the day-to-day of running a fund looks like, uh, either crypto or otherwise or both. I've started, I think, eight different investment funds, which is actually quite unusual because most people don't even start one, even if they work in the fund in- industry, because the one usually doesn't do that uh, very often. But because I worked in Eastern Europe for a while, started a couple of funds there, split a couple of funds up into pieces, so a couple more there, and then moved in the crypto space, both outside of the United States and now within the United States, I've actually started an, an extraordinarily large uh, number of funds. In terms of setting it up, uh, just very, very briefly, it, it's funny because if you have no experience in setting up a fund, it's going to cost you a lot of money. Uh, if you have a lot of experience in setting up a fund, it actually becomes probably 25% as costly to both set up and operate simply because uh, one climbs the learning curve, you can negotiate better with service providers, et cetera, et cetera. As far as running a fund, I've always divided it up into three pieces. One is uh, attracting investment. The second is making it operate, uh, all the operations, back office, middle office, however you want to describe it. And the third part, and the one that's ultimately the most important in terms of longevity or perennity, but it's an unequal weight in terms of actually managing a fund with the first two, and that is how you invest uh, the money. And there are very, very different specialties, approaches, people, skill sets involved in each of those three areas. I think that's probably a good summary to start with and feel free, obviously, to pursue where you'd like. No, absolutely. Um, That is a great summary. I think uh, as we whittle our way down to crypto, I'd love to hear a little bit about uh, how you first came to discover Bitcoin. And, you know, given that as I mentioned in the intro, you ran the first uh, crypto fund. Uh, what were some of your aha moments, so to speak, in recognizing the value of Bitcoin as you were learning about it? I'd love to be able to say I stumbled across crypto somehow and Bitcoin at the time, because this is we're talking early 2013 now, and looked at it and thought, this is brilliant, and I put all my money in it, and, and I'm long since retired and taking care of philanthropic activities. Unfortunately, I can. I started working for a, a broker, I guess would be the best way to describe it, based in Malta, and doing something totally unrelated to any of this discussion. And they knew I had a lot of experience managing funds, and they had just started a sort of a hobby. Uh, three of the founders had started uh, a Bitcoin uh, index fund. So Basically, when someone invested in the fund, they bought Bitcoin. When someone redeemed, they sold Bitcoin. So just track Bitcoin with a, with a fee or a tax, as I've taken a call it, calling it now, pardon me, of about 2%. I don't remember exactly what it was. And so they asked me to run this fund, and that was my introduction to, introduction to Bitcoin. And they told me what Bitcoin was, and I just, uh, I don't remember if I said it to them, but I certainly said it to myself. That's the stupidest idea. I have ever heard of in my entire life. That is just, this is just ridiculous. Who the hell can do this? And so I went, I ran the fund because it was an index fund. So it wasn't a, the third part of the, of the three legs of a, of a fund stool in terms of making it work is where do you invest? And so this was an index fund. There was no discretionary management. So I didn't have to be a fan of BTC to do the rest of it. And I was good at doing the rest of it. So they, they or at least they thought I was, so they hired me to do it. And that worked fine, but obviously being a reasonably curious individual, I started digging into BTC. So I actually read several articles on Mr. Ponzi. I dug into uh, all sorts of pyramid schemes. 
I did an inordinate, inordinate amount of research into the tulip mania in the late seventh, uh, sorry, very early 17th century, or maybe even late 16th century, depending on how you want to describe it, in, in Holland and spread rapidly to other countries in Europe. And I did so much that this uh, company did an award ceremony in, in Porto in May, and I was the master of ceremonies for it. And the entire theme of the award ceremony was uh, Holland and tulips uh, because of this, uh, because of all the research I had done and, and how people were amused and how seriously I took all of this as opposed to just throwing some, throwing some money at it. So anyway, I came around and uh, as a just quick aside, because I, I, I've explained what Bitcoin is in particular in crypto in general to a lot of people, fewer recently because most people at least think they have a handle on it. But one of the, the examples I used was, uh, was really compelling to a lot of people and it may be mildly interesting at least for this discussion. And that is I refer to August 15th, 1971, which is when Richard Nixon finished what Franklin Delano Roosevelt started and completed taking the U.S. off the gold standard. As a quick aside, for those who may not know, after 1931, I think it was, it was actually illegal to own physical gold in the United States. It was a crime. People went to prison for it, which most people seem to have forgotten now or never experienced because they're going back a ways. But in any event, in 1974, a bunch of Greek colonels invaded Cyprus. And that sounds like a total non sequitur, but it's not entirely because those Greek colonels invaded from the southwest, took two thirds of the island. Turkey invaded from the northeast, took the northeast one third. They divided, they divided the, the, the country into half with, uh, or two thirds and one third, with a line that's now called the Green Line that ran through the capital of Nicosia, right through the airport, which is why this relatively small island of the Mediterranean is three international airports. But in any event, the colonels in the, in the southwest. They, there was a currency there, the Cypriot pound, but it was an old style currency. And so they relaunched another currency completely from scratch. And it was the first one that was launched after 1971. And it's also interesting because it was backed by nothing. It was accepted and the Cypriot pound became one of the few currencies that was nominally stronger than the US dollar because it took two US dollars to buy a Cypriot pound. Why is that all relevant? It's because of the following question that I would ask people. Why is it that about 1.5 million people co-located on an island in the Eastern Mediterranean can simply declare by fiat that they have a currency and people accept it, and 1.5 million people who don't happen to be co-located on the same island floating in the Eastern Mediterranean can't? And there's really no good answer to that, and that was one of many angles I used when I explained crypto to people, but most people seem to find that particular comparison particularly uh, illuminating with the notion being that bitcoin now and cryptocurrencies basically allow people anywhere to do what the co-located people of cyprus were able to do is that the thought well that's going a bit further than i would go because i don't think that the term cryptocurrency I don't think either of those words uh, really apply. I use the term trading tokens to discuss it now. But let's put it this way. There was a, there's enough overlap between what a fiat currency is supposed to do, right? Unit of, uh, unit of exchange or medium of exchange, unit of measure, storage of wealth. Those are the three traditional ones. I would add a fourth in that is a mechanism for transferring wealth, although most Historical writers ignore that. I think that's very important in the in the modern day and age. Just ask Western Union, and there's not a single trading token or single cryptocurrency that provides all four of those. But collectively, they're getting reasonably close, and Bitcoin clearly fills at least one, and if you use my list, two, two of them. <clears throat> but the point is, most people think of money as a medium of exchange. Uh, cryptocurrencies or trading tokens are certainly used to some degree as media of exchange and no one's challenging their right to exist anymore and when BTC is going for ten thousand five hundred and fifty five dollars on Bitfinex I'm looking at it right now sorry I'm not looking at the price on SFOX the the there's a general consensus that's quite strong that there's some value here so the, the, the fact that that value is, ge is generated by 
a global consensus versus consensus of a bunch of folks on a single island, a single piece of dirt. I don't think that's a, it's a distinction without a difference, let's put it that way. Five, six years ago, it wasn't. So it, you know, we have to rewind a little bit when we start thinking about what everyone, how everyone felt about BTC or cryptocurrencies uh, five, six years ago. Sure, that makes sense. Um, I think maybe uh, something I'd love to ask you more about at this juncture, Tim, is uh, you know you were chatting before the call about how one aspect of your experience with crypto that's a little bit unique for the sector is that you have asset management experience that straddles both crypto and traditional markets, fiat, things like that, right? Uh, which I think, uh, at least to my ear, has already come across in your answers because, uh, as you yourself said, the way that you think about and explain something like crypto or Bitcoin is pretty unusual, um, even nowadays, I would say, amongst the explanations I've heard for it. So I'd love if you could just expand a little bit on how you see that duality of your own experience informing the way that you think about crypto um, and manage crypto funds. <laughs> Let me go back and give you the most bizarre uh, example I use, but actually folks uh, my age find it very, uh, very appealing and very understanding. I literally go back to Roman armies in Gaul when I start talking about cryptocurrencies. One of the points I make is that cryptocurrencies, they're not new, they're not innovative, they're not particularly, they're not particularly innovative, they're certainly not revolutionary. And uh, the roots of cryptocurrencies go back literally thousands of years. And the example I use is, is some Roman general rampaging around Gaul, and he needs to feed his, feed his army. So he finds a, a relatively wealthy farmer, uh, takes all of his cattle, and hands him a chit. You know, a, a, a term is actually became popularized during World War II called scrip, S-C-R-I-P. And it was basically an IOU. So, and we actually have some of these. They're written on like tanned hides and on tree bark. So this general wrote out his IOU saying, okay, this, this is good for two dollars, just which is you know, etym etymologically speaking, the origin of the word dollar. Just got to go to Rome to pick it up. And you know, a dollar was worth a lot of money, so he took all his cattle and the guy's staring at the, you know, there weren't really a lot of currencies there. Most of it was gold. So this is a first example of a, of a, a non-physical currency. And I'm sure there was some guy who decided to buy all of those IOUs for 40 cents on the dollar hike to Rome, bribe some senator with 20% of it and pocketed his gold. And, and there we went with a, a good secondary market. That's my speculation, by the way. But in any event, the, uh, the, the fact is that these IOUs, these scripts, were a parallel currency. In fact, my first cryptocurrency fund, I almost called the parallel currency fund. Uh, parallel currencies, in other words, uh, uh, different medium, media of exchange to uh, supplement hard currency and to improve over barter, which was the only other alternative, has been around for thousands of years. And that's really what Cryptocurrencies, if you take them as currencies are, they're parallel currencies. They're used to replace fiat currencies to a certain degree. And I'm not a, I'm not a uh, fanatic who's gonna say cryptocurrencies are gonna displace all currencies and you know, Bitcoin's gonna re displace the US dollar. But you don't need to go there to have, to find a really strong place for cryptocurrencies. And that place has been around literally for thousands of years. One of the reasons, from an economic standpoint, we had the Dark Ages for a thousand years, right? Since the, from the fall of the Roman Empire about 400 AD to the beginnings of the Nestor Revolution in the 17th century, uh, more than a thousand years, obviously, but rounding, is there was an expansion of M1. Uh, M1 was the money supply. The money supply was represented by gold and silver coins. Unless you happen to be sitting on a silver mine or a gold mine, you couldn't expand it. The easily, the easily discovered gold and silver mines had already been discovered in, in Europe. Uh, which is where, where generally the, the etymology of most of the modern economic thinking has come from. And so you couldn't have any real economic growth because money supply was fixed, except to the extent that some king or some lord decided to dilute 
uh, the the amount of gold in a coin, right, and and uh, makes gen generates more currency then, and then inflation took care of it because the value of that coin, as it was as it was diluted, uh, fell. So you, it's really really important to understand that the concepts behind cryptocurrency, uh, as a crypto as a currency, are not at all new. And the, and if you want to go to tokens, it's the same thing there. If you dig into where tokens are from, so it's by placing the crypto sector into historical perspective, it actually becomes a lot easier to understand because it's not nearly as new or crazy or radical as folks that have less historical experience or less historical bent would have you believe. That's really interesting. Yeah, you're the first person I've ever heard uh, in the crypto space talk about it with any kind of uh, that sort of historical bent. Uh, another aspect of your personal experience that, that I felt uh, in researching you might give you a distinctive perspective on crypto is just the sheer degree to which uh, you have international experience, right? Whether that's your degrees and stuff like international security and international business law, or you know, you had a military career uh, that put you in multiple places all over the globe. And as uh, as I was introducing the team members before I started recording this interview, you were talking to them in a couple of different languages that we have here at SVOX. So uh, you know, I, I think one of the things that a lot of people do colloquially talk about with regard to the utility of crypto is you know things like. Uh, cross-border payments uh, and enabling global economies and things like this. So I'm just wondering, uh, in terms of all of your international uh, experience and background, do you feel like that's given you uh, any kind of a distinctive perspective on crypto or how it can be used as a worldwide asset of sorts? I'll give you the ultimate waffling answer, yes and no. Uh, at the beginning, five, six years ago, I really thought that BTC would be used for remittance payments, which is the you know, general term used for, for cross-border transfers of money, particularly when they take place on a periodic basis. The, I was totally wrong, absolutely, totally, and completely wrong. And the reason was, the reason is, still is, that one needs a lot of infrastructure to use cryptocurrencies, mainly because they are not currencies. So if you, if you want to even use BTC at this point in time, you basically have to take fiat, put it on, I'll call it a platform rather than an exchange, convert it into BTC. To have it, you need a certain amount of, to hold BTC, you need a certain amount of electronic infrastructure and knowledge. To transfer it, you need an internet connection. And to get that fiat and to transfer the fiat to the exchange, you probably need a bank. You may or may not need a credit card. And at the end of the day, it's basically less flexible, a lot cheaper, but less flexible than using any of the, you know, using something like Western Union, which is the biggest, biggest uh, is a 600 pound gorilla, let's say, in terms of remittance payments. Banks really don't play a role because if you're talking remittance payments, so some taxi driver from Ghana gets called by his mother and says, I need 30 bucks for my, for, you know, for groceries this week or something. It's virtue, you can on an economically sensi sensible basis transfer that money. You can use Western Union or something and it'll still be 25% or even more of, of the amount because it's relatively small. Sending a bank wire transfer is completely absurd and that assumes both parties involved have bank accounts. So the, the idea of the unbanked and the unfinanced using cryptocurrencies for remittance payments, which is still a brilliant idea and there's a crying need for that, doesn't work because you have to have all this infrastructure to still deal with fiat. So the, the key that would make it work is if the land, if uh, let's say the, the, the mother in Ghana wanted to make a rental payment, if her landlord accepted BTC directly or if the grocery store accepted BTC directly, if it was really a true international medium of exchange, then uh, the remittance payment issue would be addressed. So in Bitcoin, this, if, if nothing else, there are a lot of issues with it, but if, if Bitcoin had a real, real stable price and have a much better chance of, of becoming a currency. And so what's replaced it, because in the same way that BTC, that Bitcoin was probably the ninth attempt at a cryptocurrency with the, with the first having taken place in Holland in 1989. 
the, the, it's the first mover, first successful mover, right? Not far from the first mover, but you always expect the, the folks who come later or often expect folks who come later to take the, what the, what the first movers have done well, keep that and throw out what they have done relatively poorly. And then you get a transition to Libra or probably co-Libra would be, would be a better example since, since the uh, Mark, Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg's cryptocurrency is actually two cryptocurrencies. There is a cryptocurrency, assuming it meets that name, or maybe we should call it a stable coin instead, that has a chance to displace fiat and be used as uh, be used for remittance payments. And the biggest single difference is simply stability. It's a stable coin. So you don't have to worry about the price increasing 10% or decreasing 10% by the time cab driver sends it to mom and mom uses it to buy groceries or uh, pay your rent. So Tim, I love all this and I definitely want to dive more into your, your perspective on all of the specifics of crypto uh, and their fundamentals, but maybe just to, to take a step back for a moment and think more about uh, your experience in fund management, right? Uh, something else that your answers have already shown is just uh, the, the breadth of experience you've had in crypto and fund management. And, you know, you, you still run a crypto fund, whereas I think a lot of the less fortunate um, set up shop and uh, ran crypto funds in the fervor that we saw in 2017, and those funds have since shut down, right? So given your experience there, you know, what would you say are some of the uh, biggest misunderstandings or misconceptions about starting and running a crypto fund? Uh, and, you know, if you're so inclined, what would you say has, has led you to be successful, whereas so, others, so many others have, um, you know, closed up shop at this point? I think I'll t take a step even further back, if you don't mind. There's a, there's a phrase I've used in a couple of, of contexts like this, and that is there are three things that folks with experience in finance have acquired, and that is knowledge, experience, and wisdom. And they've acquired that in the fiat space, right, because the, almost everyone, because the crypto space is so new. But all three of those apply directly to the crypto space. Or phrased another way, doing business in the crypto space ain't so different from doing crypto, doing business in the fiat space. The principles are the same. Human psychology hasn't changed. There, the, from, a, from a general rules and, and, and principles, again, standpoint, it's identical. What changes are a couple of things. One, it never shuts down. 24 uh, seven has an enormous number of impacts on, on how one runs a fund or trades or if it's depending on what kind of fund it is. And the second thing is partly because of the first thing, things happen really quickly. This is a very rapidly innovating space. But what I have discovered is that most mistakes that people make entering the crypto space as a fund manager, as an investor, it doesn't matter is they throw the baby out with the bathwater. They think this, oh my God, this is totally new. Nothing applies. Valuation rules don't apply. Nothing applies anymore. Absolutely, totally wrong. Everything applies. You have to be a bit creative about how you apply it at times. But all of the fundamental rules of, of investing, for instance, I, I tell people, look, why are you trying to decide whether to put all your money into this or all your money into that? Diversification, which is one of the fundamental rules of any kind of investing, applies just as much, arguably more, in the crypto space, but certainly not less. So what anybody has learned about investing, whether it be in a fund basis or an individual basis, all of that applies to the crypto, crypto space. You just need to be a little bit more nimble and a little bit more open-minded. So for that reason, there aren't a lot of people that have a lot of experience in the fiat space who have moved to the crypto space. It's happening more and more, but I was probably the first. And the reason it happens is not because they didn't necessarily believe in it or they weren't smart enough to understand it, but they were already too set in their ways and could not make the transition. So instead of trying to apply general principles, they were trying to apply specific rules. That you can't do. But all the principles of good investing, they all apply in the crypto space. Uh, maybe diving into 
the ways in which you can apply traditional wisdom to crypto a little bit more. One of the things that uh, I've been interested in uh, in my own research in crypto is this question of valuation models, right? Uh, and it's it's really interesting to hear you say uh, that kind of these these old rules can apply when I'm sure, as you know, there are a million and one different uh, new valuation models for things like Bitcoin that people are trying out. Uh, saying, as you say, oh, we, we have to rethink everything because this is so radically different. So I'd love if you could speak a little bit to how you think about um, evaluating something like Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, uh, even just the, the first principles that you need to proceed from uh, as you're thinking about these crypto assets. When I first started looking at Bitcoin, which is pretty much the only cryptocurrency that was running around at the time, the, the bar in my head that Bitcoin had to reach to become real was very high. In other words, the bar that where fiat currencies were was much higher than the starting point where Bitcoin was. And so, as I mentioned, I dug into all sorts of, you know, Ponzi schemes, this craze, that craze, you know, pyramids, the whole thing. And after a relatively court, short period of time, I realized, you know, none of those apply to Bitcoin or Bitcoin is not any of those. So what the heck is it? And then, then I started looking at the other half of the equation, the other bar, and that is, what am I really comparing Bitcoin to? Let me dig into fiat currency. Because a lot of these historical examples and stuff I've thrown out to you, I've, I didn't, five years ago, I didn't know that on August 15, 1971, um, actually, I did know that Nixon took the U.S. off the gold standard about then, but I didn't realize that Roosevelt had started it, and, and uh, before even Bretton Woods, you know, the World War II fixed currency agreement, uh, your World War II era uh, fixed currency agreement in uh, in Bretton Woods, the northeast of the U.S., New Hampshire, and so I started looking at it. Okay, what the heck? Is fiat. I mean, if I'm going to be, if I'm going to make a comparison here, I have to look at both sides of the comparison. And so I started looking at it. And so I went back into the history of money, you know, shells and salt and all this other good garbage to hard money and all this other stuff. Some of which I've I've referred to during uh, other answers, previous answers to your questions. And I realized, son of a bitch, fiat isn't what I thought it was, because. If you, if you ask even today, or maybe even more today, you ask somebody what backs the US dollar, what backs the euro, what backs the yen, what backs the Swiss franc, then they're gonna list all kinds of stuff. I've asked this question all the time, got all, all kinds of crazy answers. And, and some not so crazy answers, but they're all wrong. Because the fact of the matter, and notwithstanding what Warren Buffett tries to claim, or Alan Greenspan as well, they're not backed by anything tangible. And that to me was a real shock, right? You know, before Roosevelt, in theory, you could take all of the, all, uh, any US dollars that you had and convert it into gold. And Roosevelt was sneaky. He said, first, okay, you can't do that anymore. And then over time, between Roosevelt and Nixon, the, the presidents and the uh, secretaries of finance would slowly, or treasury, sorry, would slowly reduce the amount of, the number of U.S. dollars that were backed by gold. So it went to 90, 80, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then Nixon just cut it off. And that allowed M1 to grow. But I don't think anybody planned on QE, right, on quantitative easing, where in 2009, the United States Federal Reserve was printing, people say, but there's obviously no printing involved, $90 billion of U.S. dollars in a single month. And I'm not saying that was a bad idea. I think quantitative easing stopped the, the recession, the, you know, just another recession from turning into the Great Recession. Hopefully it wouldn't have turned into the Great Depression, but it's all speculative. But it certainly bailed us out of that. It may have kicked the can down the road because who knows what we're facing in the immediate future now, but it, it certainly was effective for a good decade. And it, made, it, made, it allowed economies to grow at varying rates around the world. So, but it also allowed or demonstrates that fiat's backed by nothing, or it's, or it's a religious question, it's backed by faith, or as the dollar used to say, the full faith and credit, right? Well, credit, throw that out when you've got $20 trillion worth of debt and it's going up by a trillion a year. What you're left with is full faith. 
And when you look at every currency in the world today, they are literally backed by nothing. And so suddenly the bar that I was looking way up, up there that Bitcoin had to meet to be acceptable in my little mind as a currency, that bar plunged. And the more I dug into fiat, the more I realized that Bitcoin didn't have to do, or cryptocurrencies didn't have to do 3,000 different things to be acceptable as money, because guess what? Fiat didn't do 3,000 different things to be acceptable as money. And then I went right back to the 74 example on Cyprus, right? These guys did nothing. There's, there are no resources on this country. There's nothing there. It lives on tourism. It's totally physically isolated. And you cut off in a nanosecond. And it still worked. So again, if 1.5 million people co-located on an island in the Eastern Pacific can make up, a, make up their own currency, why the hell can't 500,000 or 1.5 million or 5 million who aren't co-located on the same piece of dirt make a currency? And that literally became the beginning and end of the test for a currency. Is it accepted? It's accepted, yes. Why? Because people have faith that they'll be able to get something with it on the other side. That's it. That's the entire test for a currency. And that was a real eye-opener for me. So then thinking a little more about how you would say, you know, model the, the value of something like Bitcoin, right? If, if you're saying that, uh, like fiat currencies, right, uh, it's, it's mostly grounded in, say, faith or acceptance, then would the right metrics to look at be things like the number of people actually accepting Bitcoin and the extent to which it's being used? Do you even think that like evaluating it with quantitative metrics is something that's feasible? How, how would you go about that? For BTC, which is not project-based, right? It's not a utility token. Even Jay Clayton has agreed it's not a utility token or, or rather it's not a security. So it, and, and it's just something that is akin to a currency. So it, it fits in a, if it's in pretty much a unique framework, uh, the, if you look at the market cap, right, ETH is next, ETH is a backbone. It's not really a, an individual project. It's a backbone for a whole bunch of projects. Third is XRP. And I'm not even sure that should be on the list given how different it is from other things. But the, the, uh, the reason I bring that up is because the way to value different cryptocurrencies or trading tokens depends on which one. For Bitcoin, based on what I just said, there is one very, very clear metric for what Bitcoin is worth. And that is what people are willing to pay for. it. And anything more complicated than that is simply wrong because it has no intrinsic backing. So that's why if you look at the trading, which is what I do a lot of, uh, people are relying more and more on technical analysis because it's just, it's a horse trade, right? Your, your horse is worth what someone's willing to pay to buy it. And Bitcoin is certainly not the first asset that is determined solely by market value and, and not so much by what its intrinsic value is. Take gold as an example, or most of the price of gold. The intrinsic value of gold for use in industrial purposes it's subject to debate, nobody really knows, but it's probably around five or six hundred dollars. It just crossed over, it's about to cross over sixteen hundred dollars. So there's a, a thousand extra bucks there for every ounce of gold. Where's that from? And that's from what the market thinks it's worth. It's totally identical, indistinguishable from the value of Bitcoin. In gold's case, there's a, some residual intrinsic value, but the rest is all speculation. Gold has something that I, that I like to call financial, historical financial inertia behind it because for at least 10,000 years, the human race has recognized gold as having some value because it's relatively rare and it's relatively shiny. And that's it. Uh, but there is, it's important to acknowledge that a lot of the value of gold is pure speculation. It's what the market says it's worth. Folks lose track of that because gold is viewed as a safe haven, et cetera, et cetera. The reason it's viewed as a safe haven is because of that ambiguous speculative portion that's worth somewhere between one quarter and one third, sorry, between two thirds and three quarters of the uh, market value of gold. 
Bitcoin doesn't have that industrial value, right? That's, it doesn't have any physical manifestation. So it's all uh, what the market says it's worth. And there's nothing wrong with that because there are all sorts of, there are all sorts of uh, examples, diamonds being another wonderful one, right? Sure, they have industrial applications, but no one's going to take the Hope Diamond and, bun and break it into a bunch of little pieces to put it on the, uh, the blades of saws so they can you know, cut wood faster. There's this enormous value that's not based on any utility whatsoever. All of artwork is. I mean, there are all sorts of examples of assets that are valued at far, far more than whenever the utility is, right? Look at a $15,000 bottle of wine. There are no equations for any of those valuations. There's only historical precedent, which is essentially technical analysis. So the, the value of BTC is rather unique beastie within the crypto space, but there are plenty of examples uh, outside of the crypto space. And as I'm wont to do, I like to pick comparisons from each of those two worlds. When you get to other sorts of valuation, like what is IOTA worth? What is pre-search worth? What is render worth? Uh, token projects that either are backbones or have specific uh, utility that they provide, a la utility tokens, there you get into an, 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 interesting, an interesting equation because there's a minimum price that you can pretty well work out, right? This is the utility that we get from, from using this token and, and its, its price is worth X. But because there is this enormous speculative element in those, in those tokens that generally forces the, the price or has forced the prices much, much higher, it's really difficult to come up yet with a, a valuation that's say based on velocity or that's based on number of tokens held versus number of tokens used on a daily basis or based on wallets or based on concentration or based on transfers. There are, there are lots of interesting ideas, all of which have a basis in the, in the fiat world, but I don't think the dust has, or rather I'm sure, the dust has not yet settled on how to value every flavor of cryptocurrency, or in this case, much more particularly trading tokens out there. The, the world is sort of spiraling into a right answer, or more precisely, the markets and traders are sort of spiraling into a right answer. But as you can tell with the in, insane volatility in trading tokens, uh, we're a long way from a final response to that question. Sure, sure. That, I, I love that you made the comparison between Bitcoin and gold because uh, a question very intimately related to the one I just asked you uh, that I also wanted to probe you about was this question of, you know, what kind of the, the principal investment value or value proposition of something like Bitcoin is, right? Because you have that uh, kind of purely speculative, speculative excuse me, thesis, uh, but then you also have uh, with things going on in the world like uh, U.S.-China tensions and things like this, people are increasingly talking about, uh, you know, is Bitcoin also some kind of safe haven or store of value? Should we be thinking about it like gold? Uh, it sounds like from that answer you just gave, you're thinking that it's kind of the, the speculative value that would underpin its utility, even if it were a safe haven. Is that right? Or maybe you can just explain that to me a little bit more. In, terms well, of in that context, Bitcoin has no utility and it is a store of value, right? We talked about unit of, you know, uh, medium of exchange, unit of account, store of value in a way of transferring. I, the fourth one is mine. I think BTC meets the last two. That is, it's a, a great store of value or it's turning into a great store of value. And it is a, it's always been a good transfer medium, regardless of what, you know, how much miners, how many COPEX miners are getting for, moving one BTC from one end of the planet to the other. It's a heck of a lot easier to move it around than virtually any, any fiat currency. And the, the, in terms of supplementing gold, I mean, it's, Bitcoin is probably, can already say it's, the, it's crypto gold, right? It's the equivalent of gold in the crypto space. But that's not saying very much. I mean, the crypto space is tiny. It's $250 billion. Even its largest, it was less than a, less than a trillion dollars. I think it's going to grow again to that, that level and, and higher, potentially much higher, depending on what happens with the tokenization of real assets. But it's a tiny, tiny space. So 
Bitcoin is a big fish in a very, very small pond. Gold is a probably a medium-sized fish in a very, very big pond, right? Because everyone understands gold is a gold is a commodity. It gets put into commodities, but it's also got a a special asterisk next next to it, right? Because it, it because of the the safe haven aspect of it. Bitcoin is particularly now because yesterday its dominance went back up to seventy one percent, where it hasn't been in two and a half, almost two and a half years. It was last there in March of seventeen. It really and I said this in a couple of webinars I do for my, for my management company, it really is starting to move itself almost into a whole different asset class. Bitcoin is not like anything else in the cryptocurrency space. I mean, at 71%, right, it's pushing three quarters, it's over two thirds of the entire sector is represented by one thing. Well, maybe we should redefine the sector to take that one thing out of it. And we're getting to, we're getting to that point. It may never happen, but, Bitcoin is very, very different and becoming more different, not less, which frankly is another anticipation I was totally wrong about. I thought the, the Bitcoin dominance would continue to drop as the value of all of the others, the you know, 2,600 others that were competing with it, started to acquire or to demonstrate their intrinsic value. But the opposite has happened because it's taken so long for many of these projects that do have legitimate value to realize it. And in the meantime, Bitcoin is just kicking butt left, right, and sideways. Then you see things like this amazing article that came out about 10 days ago in, in, in Bloomberg, where it referred to very casually in a single sentence that gold and Bitcoin were safe havens. And I was just stunned when I read that because you know, Bitcoin went from being ridiculed or not mentioned at all, then being mentioned but ridiculed and being treated a little bit skepticism in Bloomberg. And I'm not picking on Bloomberg. I think it's a wonderful reflection of how society as a whole was was looking and looks at the crypto space in general and bitcoin in particular and i was just amazed at that reference and then what happened is like two days later uh btc dropped like seven percent what was this on august on august uh 10th uh it dropped you know, actually almost 10 percent from from just before the big move down to just afterwards from about 10 3 to 9 3 and the, a number of folks announced, okay, this is the death knell of, of crypto as a safe haven because it, you know, gold didn't do that golden plunge and, and Bitcoin is too erratic and while, or too, the price is too volatile. And while those statements are, are generally true, in, within the crypto space, BTC is clearly a safe haven. And even globally, it's not going to go from not being a safe haven to being a safe haven overnight. But clearly, that tendency is there, because frankly, in the in the Q, QE world or the post the near post QE world, the two things that people cannot find are real diversification. I mean, uncorrelated diversification. Not you buy two shares of stock and you say, "Oh, I'm diversified," because those shares shares of stock has a po have a positive 0 0.9 correlation. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about real correlation where assets don't move in lockstep with one another or in the opposite way of one another. And BTC is very clearly the least correlated asset in the world. So if you want to have an investment portfolio, you have to put something into crypto and preferably BTC. And the second thing people are looking for is yield. In the QE world, with interest rates to the floor, $17 trillion worth of bonds with negative interest rates. That's insane. Keep in mind, 20 years ago, economics text, textbooks said that negative interest rates were impossible. Uh, literally, it was just accepted wisdom. And now 60% of the world's debt, or I guess it's the other way, 40% of the world's debt has got negative interest rates. And people are even talking about the United States, which uses more debt quantitatively than anybody else in the world. That's a tough world to find yield in. And Bitcoin's appreciation, even though we're, we're not gonna see it go up 5,000% as it did in 14, is still pretty damn good, even with a drop from 20 to three, depending on when you got in, obviously, but if you have enough patience, it's gonna clearly take out 20. There's a real good argument for both Bitcoin as a safe haven, safe, I'll put in quotation marks, but much more importantly, as an investment vehicle that provides the two things that have become as rare as dodo birds in the fiat investment world, and those are real diversification and yield. Well, uh, 
that pretty great pitch for uh, taking on some crypto exposure is a nice segue into the next thing I wanted to ask you about, which, uh, you know, let's say investors who are not uh, exposed to Bitcoin right now are sold by what you're saying, uh, and they're interested in investing in crypto funds. Uh, at a high level, what would you suggest that they should look out for in terms of determining the quality of a fund? Like how can someone from the outside get a sense of whether a fund is good or not in the crypto space? Well, first let's talk about the, the three kinds of funds that really exist in the, in the crypto space, because there are only really three at this point in time. There are hold old funds, right? Hold on for dear life, the typo that's gained its own life, which is in the, in the, the equivalent of the fiat space is just a buy and hold fund. A private equity fund, which just means your, your funds are going to be locked up for a long time and presumably the yields will be greater. And then a trading fund. And a trading fund is, you know, they're going to buy and sell presumably in a way to increase the, the value of, of your uh, initial investment. And so if, if a person wants to go into the crypto space, I would first say that, go back to my first principles or the first principles of, of trading not fiat trading, not crypto trading, just of trading is diversification. I would look at, at spreading your money around a bit in the, in the crypto space, provided you have enough to do that. What I've told people, by the way, who have zero money in their, from their portfolio in the crypto space, I think there's a, there's a Forbes article that's actually got quoted in. You're a, they changed idiot to fool, but I'll give you the original quote, which is, you're an idiot if you don't invest in the crypto space, and you're an idiot if you invest too much in the crypto space. So at a minimum, I tell people, put 1% to 2% of your portfolio in the crypto space. It'll probably turn into 8 to 10% of the portfolio. And, and I've had that happen several times. And guys came to me and said, look, I'm really sorry, but I got to sell some of your fund because it's too big a piece of my investment portfolio now. This is a good problem to have. So that, that's what I would recommend to, to people as a, as a starting point. Put some in. Don't put too much in. But, but put some in. It's, it's financially irresponsible to not have some money in the crypto space. As far as evaluating funds, you're going you're gonna to start yelling at me because I keep saying the same thing, but use the same criteria you apply to a, any fund. What is its track record? What is the infrastructure like? Well, you know, do a due diligence on that fund. What is management like? How long have they, been, have they been around? What skin do they have in the game? What risk mitigation procedures do they follow? What compliance procedures? I mean, all the standard stuff that applies, boring crap, that applies to any fiat fund, it all applies to crypto funds, every bit of it. I would never yell at you for being consistent in your answers. That's my favorite thing to get me <laughs> um, So, you know, one of the things that that's also interesting and I'd love your input on is that there are just so many different profiles of um, people and investors who engage in crypto, right? And Maybe, maybe you'll just say uh, it's the same thing as with any market, which would be fine. Uh, but I'm interested because, you know, um, even within SFOX, like we see traders and people who use the platform, some of whom will just, uh, you know, buy Bitcoin once and hold on for dear life, as you said, right? Or just a single day trader who will sit and trade for him or herself. Uh, and then institutional investors, LPs, fund managers, all of these um, kind of bigger profile clients on the other hand, right? Um, do you think that there are any lessons that any of these groups could learn from any of the others? Like if I'm a regular retail guy, uh, is there something that institutional investors know about that I should know about or vice versa? Uh, could institutions learn something from just regular day traders, anything like that? That's an interesting question. I've never had anybody ask that question. There's my initial reaction is to say no, because they're in such very different places. If you're investing 1000 or $10,000 versus 1 million or 10 million, the, the underlying principles are identical but I, I'm not sure that the specific as, aspects of investing 1,000, right, where you're gonna be le probably less diversified. It's your own money, so you may, pro may apply a little bit more risk. You may do more of a hold strategy because someone's not beating on you every month for returns, as opposed to an institution where all of those things are, are the other way. I don't think there's a lot of cross-fertilization there simply because the positions are, are so different. I'm, afraid, I, I'm sorry to give you that answer, but there's nothing that readily comes to mind where there's some 
you know, eureka cross fertilization that institutional guys know that uh, retail investors don't, particularly nowadays, where so much information is available to everyone over the internet. That's fair enough. Um, maybe maybe we'll discover some some insight by the end of the interview. Who knows? Um, but uh, with that in mind, maybe maybe we can uh, focus more on the institutional side for a moment. Uh, so you know, we we've, we've seen certainly over the last couple of years, as we talked about with the blooming of crypto funds, right? There's been more institutional uh, interest in crypto writ large, right? So I'm wondering on the one hand, what do you attribute that growth of institutional investment in crypto to? And then on the other hand, uh, given that there are a lot of institutions who still haven't uh, taken on exposure to crypto, what do you think right now is the biggest obstacle or thing to be changed before even more institutions um, put crypto into their portfolio? You know, in, in connection with this question, I think I, I, I'd almost rather ask you because, I mean, let's take a look at what I, what I said earlier. The crypto space is quite small, right? A quarter of a billion dollars. What that means is, is there are tens, if not hundreds of funds on the planet that ignoring the fact they drive the price up, they could buy the entire crypto sector. And it, so it's just, it's just not very big. I mean, there are funds that aren't going to make a commitment to anything unless they can put a billion dollars in it or a hundred million dollars in it or whatever. And it doesn't, it, the crypto space isn't suited to any of that. So when people talk about institutional involvement and yeah, you hear about JPM coin and you, and you hear about, you know, Goldman Sachs opens a desk and then closes a desk to trade, to trade crypto. Yes, that's institutional involvement. It's obviously institutional involvement, but it's institutions putting in, certain institutions putting a, their little toe into the water as near as I can tell, simply because looking at market cap and trading volume, there just ain't room here for institutions. I mean, I'm sorry, $50 billion is the 24 hour trading volume according to coin market cap, CMC, right? Over the last 24 hours, 50 billion. That is three orders of magnitude less than what trades on the FX market. It's not even a pimple on a Nat's ass, right? It's just, it's, it barely exists. So from my perspective, just mathematically, there can't be a lot of institutional involvement because there isn't room in the entire sector for institutions. So I would ask, I would actually be very curious what you or any of your other colleagues on the call would be able to say about, okay, sure, you probably had a lot of institutions to a limited degree, but are there any institutions, any big institutions that are significantly involved in the space? And significantly involved, I mean volume, you know, average, average trading volume. And just looking at it, I think the answer almost has to be no, or maybe one, just because there isn't enough room. Uh, maybe I'm looking at it too simplistically. So I'd ask you to correct me if I'm wrong or any of your colleagues on the call. No, so I, th I, I mean, I think that's a great observation uh, and <laughs> other people are welcome to jump in if they want, but I think the, the takeaway there, uh, maybe actually it ties into the question that we were just talking about before about the retail versus institutional perspective, because I think oftentimes, especially within just the mere news cycle of how crypto is discussed, uh, something as, as simple as, you know, what you referenced, JPM coin or Goldman looking at a desk or something like that can seem a signal of major institutional involvement. And while institutions are interested and, you know, some funds may exist that trade crypto, right? It sounds like you're offering the healthy perspective that there's still a long ways to go if the goal is major institutional investment because it's still not even really a big enough sector for many of these really institutional institutions to, to get exposure at all, right? Yeah, the, the key word you used there was major. I mean, the average size of a crypto fund is less than $10 million. If you roll up every crypto fund, including Pantera, which is, as far as I know, is the biggest one with a couple of funds, it has roll them all together, even throw in Grayscale's Bitcoin Trust, which really isn't a fund, throw it all together, right? It's, it's a, a small fraction of the crypto space. And the crypto space itself is, is, as we said, a minuscule fraction of the investment space. So it can't be big. There can't be big involvement from big institutions. There can be tiny involvement 
from big institutions or what they consider major. I mean, I guess technically we're an institutional investor, right? We're hundred percent in crypto, but you know, we're a lot smaller in JP Morgan, unfortunately. So we don't move the needle like that. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, uh, I really appreciate that perspective. That's helpful. Uh, maybe we can switch gears here uh, and chat for a bit more specifically about SFOX. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the call, uh, you know, you are a, an SFOX client as well. Uh, and we're very thankful to have you in that regard. Uh, so I'd love to hear, how did you first hear about SFOX? Well, we've been an XFOX client since I had this over, I had a crypto fund that was an offshore fund and we set up the US one like two and a half years ago. And I'm, I honestly don't remember where I first heard about SFOX because we've been a, a client pretty much since the beginning. But I know what we were looking for. We were looking, and it's still the reason, uh, the main purpose we put uh, SFOX to, although that may expand as your range of services expands. And that is as the, the on-ramp, the gateway, the portal between uh, crypto and, and fiat because of the, all the cleverly named strategies you have, the, the octopus strategy and everything else, for being able to, to trade quite a bit in and out of, of fiat or between fiat and crypto, let's say, without moving a given market. And uh, honestly, I don't remember if it was just a, a plain old you know, internet search or something more specific. I think it was probably a general a general search, maybe it was a referral, I'm sorry, I don't really know, but we've, we've used, for over two years now, we've used the, we've used SFOX for, for that purpose, and given the fact that we are one of the referral customers when you guys did your, your Series A or Series B, uh, I think it's been a mutually beneficial uh, relationship. I think we would say so as well. Uh, I, I also love that you may have inadvertently named uh, a new trading algorithm down the line because we don't have an octopus one yet, but that sounds like it would be right. I forget what they're all called, the polar bear, whatever they are. Right? Oh, I love that one, though. Yeah, octopus is perfect. I, uh, oh, it is perfect because of the, of the diversification across. Well, in that case, I suppose you have to limit it to eight, but who knows? No, I love that. That's awesome. Um, Given, uh, you know, given that you have been an SFOX customer for a while, uh, and I'm sure you're plugged into kind of the other options out there as a fund manager, uh, what would you say differentiates SFOX from other potential solutions that you might have that keeps you coming back? Is it the kind of the, the trading algorithms as you've suggested before? That's certainly part of it. I'll give a shout out to, to Danny Kim here because another part of it is customer service it's becoming less of a differentiating factor now because customer service is improving with some of your competitors. I mean, it could hardly have gotten worse, but your, your customer service from the very beginning has been extraordinary and that counts for everything. I mean, I would, I would pay a significant number of bits of basis points more to work on, on a platform. Let me use that term where I knew I can get a hold of somebody uh, when I need to, then pay less and not be able to ever get a hold of somebody directly out of support. And I won't name any of your competitors, but I'm sure you know who they are. And the example I'll use, and this was uh, again, Danny, so you're going to, you're going to get embarrassed here. Don't look at a mirror in the near future. The, we had some issue where someone uh, fished us and I don't know how they got it, but they actually got a hold of, of the, of, some address at, at SFOX and was trying to move some of our assets around. I got a hold of Danny or I don't know if it's me, but somebody on my team got a hold of Danny at like 7.30 on a Saturday morning. And he said, just don't do anything with this. It ain't us. And, and, and that solved the, solved the issue. Uh, and it's not everybody that you can get a hold of or not every exchange or platform where you can get a hold of somebody at 7.30 in the morning and by get a hold of, I mean actually talk to them personally on their phone because I've got his personal, his personal mobile number, which is no, I won't say that, Danny. Sorry. Um, the the and it's fabulous. I mean that really really counts for a lot. That was the that's the single biggest distinguishing factor that that comes to mind. The uh, fortunately for us, I suppose, a more perhaps unfortunately for you, is there are more serious players entering into the market, 
but you guys are responding correctly by expanding your suite of products and services. And at various times with Danny and with others, I've had conversations suggesting you know, improvements that we would be interested in. And some you've done, some you've done, you, you haven't because you've got to look at where your core clientele, clientele is and where your room for growth is. But the feedback has been very, very good. Uh, I, I don't like to overuse the word partnership, and it probably doesn't apply here because we're not strictly partners or anything. But oh, sorry about that. But the uh, but this has been the closest thing to a partnership you could one could have without mutual ownership ties. That's a great way to put it. Uh, and you'll forgive me if I'm if I'm having you be redundant here uh, if you've already discussed this with Danny and others, but. Uh, I'd love to hear about you know some of the the features that you all would love to see on SFOX that aren't there already, and then maybe to make it a more broadly applicable question, as we were talking about in the beginning, you have a lot of experience both in the crypto markets and in traditional markets, so maybe just um, like features of the traditional markets uh, and the infrastructure that's there that you'd love to see in the crypto space that isn't there yet, things like that. I wish some of my team members were here because I... I run this place now, so I do less of the of the the day to day trading. But just from a general perspective, more pairs would be good. Uh, the uh, bigger discounts for doing more trading would be good. Uh, it would be great if you offered and, and this you're running under a money services license, as far as I know now. But expanding that so you had the had access to allow things like margin, both for leverage long and for shorts, things like that that would, that would encourage investors, particularly like us, to use SFOX more as a, a full service exchange. And here I'm using the word exchange deliberately because you know, it's the E in SEC is for exchanges and the SEC, as far as I know, hasn't fully licensed any crypto exchange. But if I were, if I were SFOX and I had a long-term roadmap, uh, sort of like what Circle is doing with Poloniex, I would definitely have that sort of direction, certainly as one po possible direction. I don't mean to speak for the shareholders of, of SBOX, but as a consumer, if you wanted to get more of our business, it would clearly be to replace more and more of the functionality that we receive from other, or we take advantage of on other platforms, which we can't currently do uh, on SBOX. And I'm sorry to give you a bit of a general answer, but I think that's probably more efficient than listing a whole bunch of very specific items. No, absolutely. I think that's exactly the answer I was hoping for, so thank you. Uh, I think to wrap up, uh, I have a few further questions just uh, going back into kind of the details of the crypto sector. So one thing that was interesting to me was, um, you know, looking at Digital Capital Management's website, uh, it advertises uh, active ETH and BTC management, uh, so kind of identifying the Ether uh, and Ethereum as its own distinctive aspect of the crypto sector, much like a lot of people think of Bitcoin. And one of the things that uh, I and the rest of the SFOX research team have been noticing uh, in our work over the last few months is that um, Ether and Ethereum do seem in exactly this way to be coming into their own and not just thought of as another altcoin, right? Uh, as they were for a while. So I'm just wondering from your perspective, like was there a particular moment that you remember that led you to start thinking of Ether and Ethereum as a thing unto itself, uh, as is the case with Bitcoin, like you discussed? Uh, and how do you see its value as distinct from Bitcoins and the other altcoins that are out there? Well, let me clarify what we've done. We created actually the first Bitcoin denominated, at least person we know, a Bitcoin denominated share class. And then we wanted to do ETH as well, simply because they were too biggest by market cap, but it was more difficult to find a third party that would do adequate KYC and AML for ETH transfers. Uh, it was relatively easy to do that. There were several candidates for, for BTC, but for ETH it was harder. And so the idea is, like in 18, we had, a, we had a, an interesting year because 18 in terms of ETH, the value of the, our, our, our class E, as we cleverly called it, went up 75%. It got hammered in US dollar terms, right? But if you figure ETH was gonna recover to 1400 or wherever it hit, then you're ecstatic because you got 70% more of them and it took some of the edge off of the, of the drop in US dollar terms. So the rationale there was basically let's 
take, let's attract the whole crowd to an investment fund because they sit on BTC, they sit on ETH. I mean, by definition, there are more of those than place else because of the market cap. So let's create investment vehicles for people in the, denominated in those currencies, if you will, in those tokens. And it was interesting because BTC, we have a, a lot of investors in our BTC denominated share class, but initially we had very few. It was just me and my brother actually in, in class E and it didn't take long to figure out why. And that was because we started it, started talking about it in late 17. We founded, I think in April of 18, founded the share class. And anyone who had ETH was not so much in 18, but certainly in 17 was dumping him into one ICO or another. So what we did was then start to go to ICO companies, you know, the recipients of these ETH and say, hey, you've got your, your cash flow here, you've got your controller, you've got all the cash you're sitting on, whether it be fiat or, or crypto, Let it, give us what you have in crypto and we'll make it grow. And sure enough, we had all sorts of ICO companies that then gave us mostly ETH, some, some BTC, mainly because when they did their distribution, let's call it, they received ETH and they were sitting on a whole bunch of ETH. So had they been smart, obviously, they would have sold it into, into fiat and, and watched it go down, but many of them just watched the, the value of their ETH go down. And since they're, they were incurring expenses in fiat, that was an expensive proposition. I mean, billions of dollars were lost by people who just sat on their ETH. People who invested with us lost a lot less in USD terms and gained a lot more back with, uh, you know, since we bounced off of 80, although obviously BTC's lost, or ETH has lost half its value again in the last several months, but still it's more than double its low. And for people who had 70% or 75%, whatever it was for 18, increase in the number of ETH, they're feeling a lot better now than, than people who didn't do that. So the idea there was to have gains generated, denominated in crypto, not in fiat. Got it. Got it. That makes sense. Um, I imagine the, the, the degree to which that investment vehicle was innovative might have made it a little, a little bit harder to explain how it functioned to LPs uh, as you were attracting investments. Is that true? Did you, did you have trouble with that? Well, maybe less than you realize because or might realize because the only people by definition who are interested in those two share classes were crypto fanatics. Right. So a lot of those guys, a lot of those people are already thinking, you know, they're sort of their lives are sort of denominated in BTC or ETH or certainly less rooted in fiat than the rest of the world. So, yeah, there were some nuances to explain, but it wasn't nearly as bad as or as difficult as your question sort of implies, mainly because these people, you know, they were the aficionados. They had climbed a lot of the learning curve already. That makes sense. So it's kind of a, a self-selecting audience. Nice. Yeah. Um, bouncing off of uh, everything we just discussed about ETH, uh, you know, one of the things that I'm always curious to pick people's brains about um, in the crypto sector is kind of where they see the future of the industry in terms of how many uh, different crypto assets will be successful ultimately, right? You know, you have Bitcoin maximalists who think that, that it'll just be BTC and everything else goes to zero. Some people who think there'll be just a handful, some people who think there'll be a huge plurality. So do you have any views on that in terms of whether you think there'll be a lot of successful crypto assets or, or just a few in the long term? Well, again, I go back to first principles of investing. If you look at ICO companies as startups, at least the ones that weren't outright frauds. If you look at them as startups, 90% of startups fail. So I think in the crypto space, we can naturally assume, let's say 50% of these are the, the huge, insane range of, of ICO projects were, were frauds, or at least people did a lame effort to try to do anything and it didn't work. When it wasn't super easy, they let it go. So you've got 50% left, 90% of those are going to go belly under. So it's probably 90, 95% of all crypto projects are, are going to die. And that sounds like a huge number, but it's really not. I mean, it's in the overall context, it's, it's pretty natural. Uh, but 95% of 2,600 or pick your number is still quite a bit. So uh, clearly BTC is going to survive for a long time. 
uh, probably until the last one is mined, I can, uh, the, the headlines that's going to make, I don't know if any of us will be alive because, you know, it used to be 2026, that's 2041. I recently saw a study that talked about 2090 because difficulty is increasing so much. Who knows? We may never find the last, uh, the last Bitcoin, but when it hits the last million and the last hundred thousand, everybody likes round numbers, that's going to be huge headlines, right? Drive the price up at least for a while, rationally or otherwise. But there are going to be a lot of other, let's call them cryptocurrencies, running around. They'll be, they'll be the backbone cryptocurrencies, right? The the ETHs, the IOTAs, and some of the others. They'll be the anonymous coins that governments will try to go after. You know, the dashes and the and the moneros. There'll be uh, coins that provide direct utility, like you know, like Bat or Presearch, uh, for instance. And and there'll be tokens, tokens like like subway tokens and amusement park tokens, and we haven't got down the rabbit hole of the etymology of that, but hey, they have some utility. And they got a public market, cool. Uh, so a, a lot of them will survive, and then we'll get back to the valuation discussion that we had earlier. Uh, so in numerical terms, it'll, it'll be you know, maybe triple figures, but it almost certainly won't be quadruple figures. And if it is, it's only gonna be because there's some meta coin that's gonna link them all together, because you can't walk around with an electronic or a physical wallet with 500 currencies in it, right? So there's got to be a way of simplifying that down effectively to one or to the point where the currency just essentially becomes zero and you just look at a, you know, a thermometer in your wallet to see if you've got the money to pay for something. So the, the, it's not going to go to zero, but there, it's kind of a comparison of apples and oranges because as we discussed earlier, Bitcoin plays a very different role in financial life than, than say, ETH does, or XRP does, or Presearch does, or IOTA does. Very different roles. Sure, sure, that makes sense. Uh, I think that will segue into uh, the last question that I love to ask everyone in these, uh, which is two parts. First, uh, as you look at the industry today, uh, the crypto sector, that is, uh, what are you most excited about in terms of the opportunities you see out there uh, for the future of crypto? Uh, and then on the other hand, what do you think are the biggest challenges ahead for it? Well, let me take them in the, the other order. The biggest challenge for crypto is mainstream acceptance. And uh, really generalizing, there are probably two big baskets that that fits in. One is regulation, and the other is ease of use. And they, uh, they're, very, they're very, very different. There's not much overlap between the, the two of those. But both of those factors are, are real challenges for uh, the crypto space, if I'm speaking at a, at a super high level. What I'm excited about is the general acceptance, the increasing acceptance of crypto. I mean, it's, without that, it just becomes somebody's hobby. Uh, if, it's, if it's only 1.5 million people on an island in, a, in, a, in the Mediterranean that accept, that accept uh, BTC, it's not all that big a deal since you got 7 billion people on the planet. But the fact that it's rolling out things like Libra, regardless of what you think of the project, the fact that people actually took it seriously and pay attention to it, uh, that, that to me, the general acceptance is, is probably the first point that I'm really excited about. The second one is tokenization of real assets, which in a way is crypto. In a way, it's not at all crypto. But when you can, my favorite example is, I want to go to the, and I still may do this, go to the president of the Louvre Museum in Paris and say, hey, how'd you like to sell the Mona Lisa? And of course, they'll tell me to pound sand and throw me out. I said, okay, how about you sell half the Mona Lisa? You keep half of it, but you keep physical possession. Okay, you sell 49%. And so then you go to the, all the art lovers in the world and say, we're going to sell you. We're going to tokenize the Mona Lisa. The Mona Lisa is now represented by 1 million tokens. We will sell you a token for $1,000, which not incidentally values the Mona Lisa at a billion dollars. And, and you can represent that you are an, a legitimately an owner of the Mona Lisa. And for another 50 bucks, we will give you a certificate that's gold, gold plated that says, you know, hang on your wall, that says you own one token of, uh, of the Mona Lisa. And every third Thursday of every quarter, you can go in and look at your piece of art that you own in the Louvre free of charge or whatever, some such combination. Then the Louvre, which gets $490 million out of that deal, goes out and buys some more art, which if it's popular enough, can t it can tokenize, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, Rinse and, rinse and repeat. Uh, 
so the, the tokenization of, of real estate, for instance, which everyone loves, and, and at some point in time, there'll be an announcement for a new subway system in Austin, Texas, and here are where the stop, here's where all the subway stops are gonna be. And you can go to a map with tokenized real estate and you put $1,000 into each of the, in one building next to each of the locations where the, subject, where the subway is gonna stop. That's impossible today. You can't put $1,000 in a piece of real estate. But tokenization will allow that. To, uh, tokenization in terms of provenance, right? So wine, sports mem memorabilia, blood diamonds, uh, everything. You'll know where it came from because if it's listed twice on the blockchain, you got a problem. Uh, there, that sort of, that, that, those sort of developments where you, you really, they're more blockchain envelop, developments than crypto. Trading tokens need a blockchain, but cryptocurrencies or, or the blockchain doesn't need trading tokens. The blockchain is all about trust. It's simply a list you can trust. And if you look at the finance system, the entire finance system is built on overcoming a lack of trust. Not distrust, but just, I can't trust you because I don't know you. That's why letters of credit exist. That's why literally the entire financial system has been built. What the blockchain is going to do, just because you can trust it, it's much easier to list the business or the sector, the business sectors that won't be seriously affected and positively affected by, by the blockchain, by a trusted source of information than it is to list those business sectors that will be affected by. And I think I'll stop there because as I think about it, there are a whole bunch of other areas I get truly excited about, but those are some of them. Well, well put. And to crib your phrase from earlier in this interview, having too many cool use cases to think of is a good problem to have, right? So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Nice to end on that note. Um, well, Tim, on behalf of everyone at SFOX, uh, thank you again so much for your time. This, I know, has been super illuminating for me, uh, and I'm sure for the rest of the team as well. We're so happy to have you all uh, as a client at SFOX, and I will uh, definitely follow up with all the info about getting this published and the transcript and stuff and hope to get it uh, out to our community within the next week or two. But again, thank you so much. Uh, I, I really appreciate you being so generous with your time uh, and, and your knowledge. I learned a lot from you, so thank you. Sure, thank you very much. Thanks for, for organizing all of this. All right, thanks again, and uh, we'll be in touch soon, okay? You have a all great right, Take care. All right, thank bye. you. Bye-bye.